maybe I'm a halfway decent, clever guy, but if I don't surround myself with people that are as good or better than me, I have no chance of success. This is Velocitize Talks and I'm Andy North. I'm here today with Freddie Laker, founding partner, Chameleon Collective. Freddie, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So let's just start with it, Chameleon Collective. Tell us a little bit about it and what sets it apart in the marketplace. Great, uh, Chameleon Collective is a company I founded about five years ago. Uh, and we have a pretty unique way of transforming businesses. Uh, so the company has three core divisions. We've got uh, about 30 interim leaders. Our shtick is all commercial growth. So they heads of marketing, heads of sales, or heads of digital. Uh, we've got about 60 subject matter experts that can support those leaders or the leaders of our client companies. And we have uh, seven full-time recruiters. And what we effectively do is go into businesses, airdrop in these, these leaders, leaders, you know, drive change, leaders make meaningful impact in business, I think in a way that maybe your everyday worker can't. And we use these leaders and a supporting crew basically to make big impactful changes within uh, the companies we support. Frequently, those companies are actually uh, coming into the P or BC world. Um, and then we actually use our recruiters to backfill and find all the permanent staff that we know our clients are looking for. Um, so this makes us both a short-term and a long-term solution uh, for board CEOs and investors that are basically trying to make significant change in their companies really fast. You've been in the, the agency in the digital world, world for most of your career. In fact, I think when you look up serial entrepreneur, it says, see Freddie Laker. Uh, you've also worn a lot of hats with those companies. What lessons have you learned over your career, particularly early on as an entrepreneur? You know, I think things that I've learned along the way, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do, funny enough, with going back to this concept of leaders. Maybe it's why I'm in the business I'm in. Um, you know, in the earlier stages of, of uh, the companies I've, I've been in, um, you know, I, I think that you have the sense that maybe you, you know, can do it all on your own or you struggle to trust other people or maybe you don't want to spend the money that it takes to attract equals, peers, people that are on your level. And what I've come to realize is that, um, you know, maybe I'm a halfway decent, clever guy, but if I don't surround myself with people that are as good or better than me, I have no chance of success. And you have to be empathetic um, to that. You have to think of yourself, well, why would I join a company? And if you can't do something that would make you want to join, why would anyone else want to do that? Um, so I've tried really hard to uh, create businesses that are as good for the people working in the company as they're good for me. And lo and behold, you can attract some pretty amazing talent that way. And without the right people, you've just got no chance. Recently, you've done multiple interim leadership roles, giving you a unique perspective of helping transform businesses from a leadership perspective across many industries in, in a really short period of time. What lessons have you learned from that? I think the biggest thing that I've learned is, regardless of the size of the company, a lot of the problems um, are the same. Uh, those are uh, you know, lack, lack of leadership, uh, lack of clear vision, trying to understand um, you know, which way you're supposed to run. Um, I also see that a lot of companies um, have struggled to um, try and risk, uh, and try and risk new things, new forms of marketing. A lot of people fell behind the ball, um, specifically with, with digital. Um, and then the other thing I've seen a lot of is just people having, again, sometimes great, great products, um, great companies, great cultures, but not understanding how to work together. Um, you know, this, this sense that, you know, a lot of people have got all their plans up here or the ideas up here, um, but they don't understand how to um, put systems and processes in place that make uh, you know, what could be really painful tasks really painless by doing them over and over and over again um, in a really, really efficient way. I want to jump to 2020 and, and what many have called a transformative year. I think there's a lot of descriptors for it. Uh, it, it definitely changed how people worked and how people view work, uh, which was already very much in flux and changing to begin with. What do you believe is the future of work? I'm starting to feel like that science fiction inspired future is, is feels more like the near term for us now. Um, you know, yes, in the last year, you saw people uh, shift to remote work. Uh, worth noting, we've been working remotely for five years, have no physical offices, never have done. 
Um, that seemed a little crazy to people. And now this year, you know, it was very much the norm. Um, I think you're going to start seeing um, a shift to uh, obviously more gig economy type work. I think you're going to see a lot more freelancers. I think you're going to see a lot more independent workers. That's a trend that's already been happening for a couple of years. What I think the future of work is, um, and what I like to call the like post post gig economy or almost like post up work esque kind of world, is I think you're going to start seeing um, more of these platforms that um, take the best parts of corporate life, scalability, community, infrastructure, you know, some of the, the nice things that we're, you know, that we're used to having when you go into a big office and then merging that with the things that we like about independent work, freedom to pick and choose how you work, who you work with, who you work for, maximizing your earning potential. And they're going to find some kind of compromise that sits in between those two things. What trends are you seeing around how brands are approaching customer experience as they go forward? We work with a lot of different companies at different sizes and sophistications. What we're noticing is that the smaller companies out there are finally starting to take uh, customer experience seriously. And the larger companies that didn't take customer experience seriously are, are, are starting to have challenges as they're having to rapidly catch up. Um, with some of their uh, comp competition. The thing that I think is so unique is in the past, when you talked about customer experience to a lot of, um, whether it be big box retailers or you know, uh, even travel companies and things like that, the experience was always about a physical location. And so what the last year has done is kind of made people go, well, what does my experience mean when all of my touch points or the vast, vast majority of my touch points are now in the digital space? And so we're seeing, um, you know, companies take real meaningful and keyword thoughtful uh, time to really think about what that customer experience uh, looks like now. When you've got over 8,000 MarTech solutions at last count, uh, and they all somehow need to work seamlessly together to, to work well, uh, how is this ultimately affecting customers? Is it, is, it, is it working for the good? Or do you see digital and technology actually getting in the way of ultimately providing that great customer experience, which you spoke of? The, the cost of some of these uh, tools, uh, basically, you know, we're talking about things that I would have paid thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars for you know, 10 or 15 years ago, now being, and in some cases, a $9.99 or $19.99 a month recurring subscription. I mean, incredible uh, access to technology that, you know, beyond anything we could have dreamt of you know, back in the day. Great example of that, you know, everyone always kind of cracks jokes about uh, MailChimp, but MailChimp has actually gone out there and implemented a lot of marketing automation features that would have been considered, you know, cutting edge on large enterprise um, you know, CRM and marketing automation platforms from, you know, even four or five years ago. Um, and you can do this, you know, we're now, you know, a, a small e-commerce company or a small business can start adapting uh, a, a, these kind of uh, automated marketing experiences right into their customer experience. Um, where I think this can go awry is uh, first, too many of these off the platform technologies kind of out there and then not being inter interlinked, which is why, if you ever do go out there and look at these things, looking at integrations is such an important part of it to try and get all these systems to talk to each other. Um, and then see the other big um, challenge I've seen people do is get very, very excited about uh, the technologies that they can integrate. Uh, but then thinking that it's some kind of magic that, you know, that no human would have to be involved and not um, properly staffing and not uh, properly building you know, these tools into their processes and their workflow and frankly, into their broader strategies. Um, so there's some of them that can be underutilized. So would you say that some of these technologies are actually leveling the playing field from the global brands who can afford a lot of these technologies to perhaps a small business or a small agency who could perhaps tap into something like that? And then, and then now they have the, the same ability to work with their customer experience as a global company. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's again some of the things that you you, you know I see now that are kind of available to everyday people for you know sub one hundred dollars a month is is it's an enterprise is enterprise grade technology um, brought to the masses. Um, you know, the, I'd say the biggest obstacle that most people have is is just having the courage to to try and uh, try them, experiment with them, play with them. 
a lot of them have free trials. Um, so if you're kind of digitally inclined, I find most of these tools to be pretty intuitive and, and most people can get down there and just kind of figure them out. One of the questions we like to ask all our guests is, is there a book, a blog, or a podcast that you'd like to share with our viewers? I've actually been uh, producing a uh, web series. I don't think it qualifies as a podcast uh, for the last uh, year or so. I went really, really deep on it um, uh, during the pandemic. Um, it's called Oh Ship. And it is a uh, nautically themed uh, show for about entrepreneurs, um, leaders uh, who may have had some great success in their careers, um, but take the moment to celebrate some of their failures um, and maybe never told before stories of where things almost went wrong, or as I like to refer to them, oh ship moments. Okay, now I'm fascinated. Can you give us an example of, of one of the leaders you're talking about? We have spoken to everyone from... Uh, Carol Cruz, uh, who was the former global head of digital at Coca-Cola, uh, who's a, you know, a, a, an old friend of mine, uh, to the you know, former global chief creative officer of PwC. Uh, you know, the, 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 list, the list kind of goes on uh, with some, some of these interesting folks who had it's everything from you know, agency leaders to you know, uh, another chap um, who was just on recently you know, has sold multiple companies for you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. My guest today has been Freddie Laker, founding partner at Chameleon Collective. Freddie, thank you so much. I could have spent hours with you uh, and it would just be you and I watching it. But uh, thank you so much. Awesome. It was great seeing you.